I am sitting here with the legends themselves, Metallic. I've been waiting for this day for months. <laughs> this is insane. You've been talking about it for months. You know, we were playing a Guns N' Roses song while you guys were getting set up. Did it, I remember you guys had a whole thing with them, right? Uh, James, right? You hated those fucking guys. <laughs> you went on tour with them, and it was just a nightmare, wasn't it? <laughs> Do I have that right? You do have it right. Yeah. What was the rub there? Because uh, those guys are infamously late. And uh, was that the the rub, or were they just yeah, prima donnas? Yeah, that donors? was it. They were always late. That's why I hated them. Was that the I reason? think they pretty much stood for everything we didn't like. Mm. The glam, the L.A., the everything. Everything we kind of escaped in the early days, you know? Yeah, because everything I know about you guys. And, and, and you know, I, I think people think rock stars are going to be late. They don't care about their fans. You guys, even at the Apollo Saturday night, you're there, you start on time, you don't, no bullshit with everyone waiting for you like prima donnas. I appreciate that so much. I As love someone, that, Yeah, too. I, I, it's important to me. You guys look like you were having fun. What I saw Saturday night is a tremendous amount of energy. Have you ever weighed yourselves in terms of how much weight you lose during a show? I'm being serious. <laughs> Would you lose five like to ten fighters, pounds? Like fighters, huh? Like fighters. Maybe. I mean, you're, you're, I know my friend said, my friend wanted to put a pedometer on me because you know the the death magnetic stage and uh i mean it took up the whole hockey arena he wanted to see how how far we ran during the show it is an amazing amount of energy and the thing i kept thinking when i was watching you saturday night and even when i saw the concert film which by the way is a beautiful film i've never seen a band shot that well and the sound to be that intense and Thank we'll you. talk about that in a minute but when i'm watching you guys you genuinely appear to be having fun and I was wondering, like, I was actually nervous for you. I said, eh, it's a small hall, it's 1,500 people, are you going to give a shit? And are you just going to go through the motions? And I, I, I got the feeling that you guys were moved by being in the Apollo Theater. Is that oh, true? Yeah. So much history there, obviously. And when people are that close, it really makes you uh, step up. I mean, you couldn't see it from where you were, but there's three, three levels. So everybody on the floor are close, everybody on the second tier are really close, and people. So you can basically see everybody in the whole in the whole uh, uh, venue, and everybody just feels like they're sitting right on top of you. So you're playing to every single person, and then it's really cool. And after all these years, it still feels new to you when you're playing something that small. Well, especially when you're playing a place like that. You know, it's got such musical history, and we're. You're pretty much honored to be in a place like that. Uh, but the small gig, you know, no matter what the gig is, we get nervous and we're excited about it. You do get nervous. Totally. Because yeah. you, you mentioned that during the show. When you say you were nervous, some songs are harder to play than others, right? Right, right. And by that you mean, I, I notice that, that when you and Kirk are playing together, sometimes I'm reminded of the Allman Brothers. Because when uh, Dickie Betts and Dwayne Allman used to be able to jam together, they were one of the few guys that could play dual leads and harmonize with their leads. And you guys appear to be doing that same trick, but I, I think that's tough to do. I think that's the hardest thing to do. How many bands do that? A uh, big inspiration on, on James and I was that band Thin Lizzy. They played a lot of guitar harmonies. Right. And, you know, once you, once you figure out what uh, each guy is going to be playing, you stick to that, it's, 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 it's pretty easy. Does the rehearsal time for a tour get insane? Because, you know, I think people think you wing it when you're up there, and each time it's a little <laughs> different. There's no wing in it, right? I mean, you guys have to be that precise. I'll tell you something. Lately, I feel like we've kind of been winging it. You know, we've been on this incredible uh, schedule, whether it's a press schedule or just even with our families, you know, because we really balance everything out. Yeah. And... Um, and the scary thing is, is we've been pulling it off. I mean, we flew into Denmark for Roskilde Festival, and we actually had a great show. And then the other night we were in uh, Rio de Janeiro for Rock in Rio, and we pulled that off, and we were, like, really in the twilight zone. We, our time, body clock was off. Yeah, so. because it seems like you've got a lot to memorize, in a sense, yeah. right? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of trust. It's a yeah. lot of trust that when you get up there, if you have the confidence that you know you're you're pretty good at what you got going on and you've knocked the rust off at least on your own when you get up there you have to trust that whatever happens in the moment you're going to be able to be okay with it like i'm sure you on your show whatever's thrown at you 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 feel confident about and you can you can trust that the right thing's going to happen next how old were you when you started playing guitar 
I think 14. 14. 14. Yeah. Up until then, no music lessons, nothing like that. Yeah, I had uh, uh, I had to take piano lessons. And you hated it, I, I bet. I hated it. <laughs> and the guitar was your salvation because you knew you wanted to be a musician in some right. weird way, and then you get a hold of a guitar and you start playing. Yeah. And, and did someone teach you to play the guitar? or no. do you, you just learned that on your own. I did learn it on my own. That's yeah. fucking crazy to me how you do that. <laughs> how old are you when you write your first song? Uh, I think it was 15. 15? Yeah, and the, the band hated it, so I fired them. <laughs> <laughs> and it took you a long time to figure out how to sing, in the sense that... Um, um, Still I, figuring it out. I was listening to an early... This is an early record, a recording, and you were... You, you were trying to find your voice, I feel, mm -hmm. and you almost sounded like more like Robert Plant than the guy you sound like today. Am I hmm. correct? I'm going to play a little of this. Tell, tell me what, what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. You don't go up His high His bowls like that hadn't anymore. dropped yet. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> all three of them. But when you're an artist and you start thinking about doing a band and all that stuff, don't you get sort of confused uh, in terms of like, how, how do I find... Like when I, when I first got into radio, I used to talk up here. I was nervous. I was tight. My voice wouldn't drop. And I talk really fast and nasally. Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. When do you find your style that we all know today? Well, you do it a lot. Right. You tour a lot. And you, you build up confidence. You build up confidence within you know, your little family around you. And they guide you, too. You know, you can you ask questions like, what does that sound like? Or... You know, you listen to yourself back, and you go, "Wow, I'd rather not sound like that." <laughs> I, I noticed, a, I noticed a big, um, because even in the early days uh, when we were playing clubs and stuff around LA and San Francisco, James was so shy that he didn't even used to talk to the audience. Dave Mustaine, our guitar player, used to do all the talking. Right. I noticed the biggest transformation was when, the first time we went to Europe in 1984. We got out in front of the European audiences. And there were thousands of them just welcoming us, you know, and they've been waiting for us for a couple of years. And I noticed a big change in James. He all of a sudden started finding himself and communicating with the audience and getting a lot more confident. Yeah, and that's a tough thing to develop. It just happens with thousands of hours of practice. You know, I was watching Led Zeppelin getting this Kennedy Center honors, and I was thinking about you guys. Uh, you guys rock harder even than Zeppelin, and, and I've been to Zeppelin shows back in, like, the, the early 70s. And I was thinking, would you guys want an honor like the Kennedy Center Honors, or would you laugh at something like that? Do you laugh when you see Led Zeppelin getting honored in a very traditional way? I'm curious. I don't laugh. I, you know, I, I think it's great that they, they, they're still, after all these years, are still being acknowledged and getting awards like that. And I just hope that, that you know... When we're old, old and older, fat, and older, <laughs> older yeah, and fatter. Yeah, yeah. But if Metallica was asked <laughs> to go to yourself. the Ken if Metallica was asked to go to the Kennedy Center Honors and be honored, you would do something traditional like that, or would you just say, "Hey, fuck that. That's just too. That, that's not us." I, I mean, it we depends don't, we on don't, where it's coming from, you know. If, we if, don't if, have an across-the-board policy about that type of stuff. We look at each one of them and go, "That's cool. That's not so cool." I think that um, we've always been open to receiving that type of stuff because we've always felt that the accolades that come our way, you know, we've done everything our way on our terms. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We did it all our own fucking way. We 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 did it the Metallica way. We never sold out. We never did anything for other than just what we felt was pure and honest. And so. Kennedy Center, sure. Free yeah. trip to Washington. Why not? I, I find, yeah, right. I find the greatest bands are the ones that don't sell out. In other words, you could have changed your sound to a more commercial sound. You know, you could have been pressured into that by a record company. I was watching, you know, you guys were going through like sort of the history of Metallica on stage Saturday night, and even in the movie you do this. And I and I'm listening to these songs, and I'm like, well, at any point, someone could have said to you, look, this isn't commercial, and you say, yeah, fuck it. Let's just, you know, we'll write, we'll write a real commercial album. And we'll sell our sound out, and you never did it. And that's why I think the audiences still respond to you guys. I agree completely. Yeah. They see the honesty in what you do, and at, at, you know it's all relative. Someone, we've heard that we've sold out a million forever. times, forever, <laughs> right? But it's all relative to what your world is and if, how small your world is. So we've 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 stayed honest to ourselves, and that's all we can. That's all we can do. When did the sellout bullshit start? When the Black Album came out? Was oh, it started way before that. Yeah. Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning. On the second album, we had a song called Fade to Black that we still play almost at every show. And um, James thought it would be a great idea to have acoustic guitars 
on right. the album. And right. so when the metal community heard a Metallica <laughs> song with acoustic guitars, they all lost their fucking lunches. <laughs> big time. This there is you the go. song you're talking there about. There you go, the big sellout. And to me, this is 29 most, years ago. <laughs> it is one of the most beautiful songs out there. I mean, wow, what a it was song. Honest. You know, that's that. Well, fade to black. Lars said the writing of this song that, that James, you were obsessed with death. That this was your death <laughs> obsession. Is that true? Uh, still am, somewhat. I think there's a fear of death that we all kind of struggle with and battle with. I think at that point, I remember writing Fade to Black. Uh, uh, I think it was Metal Joe's, Metal on uh, Metal Joe's couch. When Who's Metal guys, Joe? Metal Joe. You don't know Metal Joe? No. Metal Joe. <laughs> I don't know Metal Man, Joe. Infamous Metal Joe. He took us in when our manager uh, basically kicked us out of his house. And, over in uh, Jersey. Yeah, over in over Jersey. Over in Old Bridge, New Jersey. 1983. Yeah, Old wow. Bridge. We lived out on his farm, and we just partied and played and wrote songs. And uh, I think at that point, we were supposed to go. We were supposed to go to Europe for the first time. Twisted Sister. Yeah, and, and our gear garage. had gotten stolen. We got the phone call that not only was our, well, our, 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 our then tour manager, had a U-Haul filled with our gear. Someone <laughs> stole the whole U-Haul. It, does, it wow. doesn't get more depressing than that when you're a band and your gear is stolen. You don't have the money to <laughs> replace it. Now you can't even play. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were lucky that we, we had our guitars with us. So uh, uh, it was so it was, cold in Boston. That's yeah. where they got stolen. So, so now you can joke about it, but at that point you were so depressed. You had oh, nowhere to live worst, yeah. and all your gear was stolen. And then you start thinking about, Jesus, what the hell is life all about? And we're going to die anyway. Well, more like our career's over. We're, we're screwed. We're, we're, you know. And then you come up with this. Yeah. Gives me chills. It's fantastic. Do you guys think you're given the acknowledgement as musicians that you deserve? I was watching Lars, first of all, and I've heard guys say, oh, Lars isn't the greatest drum. I never saw a guy drum like this fucking guy <laughs> on stage Saturday night. I've never seen anybody do it. I don't know how the hell you do it. Don't you think you, you don't get enough credit? Um, and I'm not just sucking your balls because you're here. No, I know you're not, man. I'm um, not. You know, we, we have our own thing, and, and we have our own, you know, we're not, none of us are sort of virtuosos. You know, we, we don't... Uh, you know, in the metal community, there's a lot of who's the fastest guy and who's the most gifted and who can go blah, 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 faster than the other guy. Right. It's, that's never been our thing. We were always more about songs. The right. main thing the was melodies the song, and the, 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 the song and the feel, the purity and the, the the sort of the band vibe and all that stuff about who's the fastest drummer and is Kurt better than the guy. You didn't get other caught band. up in that bullshit. We never got caught up. Everybody else got caught up in that. And so, along the way. We were just more comfortable just being ourselves, and and so there was a little bit, I think, from the heavy metal community, a little bit of disdain that we weren't sort of serious enough, or we weren't, you know, practicing enough, or we weren't all this type of stuff. And that's people have been throwing that at us for almost 30, 30 years, and it doesn't matter. Robert, I was watching you play the bass, and are you channeling a little Jack Bruce there when you play chords on your bass? Because he was like the first guy to do that, wasn't he? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, was he, were you a fan of Cream? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I grew up listening to everything from Motown. That was the thing that was so impressive, um, the spirit of the Apollo, because all the, everything from Buddy Holly to James Brown to Jimi Hendrix. And you know to, what's funny? To the Temptations. I mean, and I grew up on that stuff, and that's kind of the same stuff that um, Jack Bruce and even like Geezer Butler, you know, they all came up with that. I mean, Led Zeppelin wouldn't be Led Zeppelin if it wasn't for the Apollo because all those bass lines that John Paul Jones was playing were inspired by James Jamerson. And, uh, well, what I thought was funny, I was reading the reviews of the show. They were fabulous. But they were saying how you guys musically have no roots to the Apollo people, and that's bullshit. Anybody in rock and roll has roots because you were joking on stage, James, like, I can't even believe they let us in here because, you know. But the fact is you guys do draw on some of the great uh, R&B artists, right? I mean, it's it's just because it's metal doesn't mean it's not. Yeah, it's all, I mean, it's all linked. I mean, a lot of... A lot of hard rock and, and metal obviously comes from the blues, you know, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. that go, Cream like you were just talking about, that all goes back to the blues. And obviously the blues is linked to everything that was going on up at the Apollo. So 
it's all connected like a spider web way back there, you know. One of the great moments in the show is uh, the Marianne uh, faithful uh, thing, you know. This, this, this. <laughs> to me, this is... You could have done that part, Howard. They didn't call me up. I thought you guys <laughs> might call on me for that. I would have been... <laughs> When I was in the audience, everybody joins in and sings that part. Yeah. That is an incredible moment. Doesn't that give you the chills when everyone knows your song? It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I've been searching, I mean, at least my life, been searching for connection and belonging everywhere in my, all my life. And when someone's singing along to your lyrics, there's nothing more connecting. Yeah, oh, it's so beautiful. But how did you think of Marianne Faithful? Because first of all, who even knew her voice got that deep? You know what I mean? Uh, how did you how did you hook up with her on that song? I think she might have had a cigarette or two. Yeah, I think so in between. I, yeah. I don't know how yeah, that but she's been putting out her. music. Yeah. We got yeah. hooked up with her. I mean, the whole song idea is based around Sunset Boulevard and the 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 star that is is still in in the bubble of <laughs> of greatness even though the time has passed and her voice had had a lot of weatherness, or oh, whatever the word. It was be. weathered, yeah. Weathered. But there's a beauty to it. I mean, still like a, an absolute Very beauty. Much. You know, um, Bob Rock, our producer, uh, suggested her, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, James and I flew over to uh, to Dublin with the master tapes <laughs> under our arms and <laughs> walked into a recording studio, met Marianne Faithful, and she uh, had a glass of wine and did it in about, what, two takes? Pretty much. And it was so cool. <laughs> we were just sitting there going, holy fuck, here's this legend singing our song, and she just nailed it, right? That was the thing that blew my mind. I don't even think you showed her the melody, like, one go around, and then she just nailed oh, it. Oh, it's so classic. Yeah. Go it's just, it's just, uh, la, 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 la. oh, I, and then that went on for 10 minutes, and I was like, hey, this is great. Let's just keep doing this all night. We don't have to keep going. Howard, I think you're showing off because you sing it so well. <laughs> la, 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 la. You guys didn't realize I'm a singer. The one thing he sings well. Yeah. You know, uh, next time, man, next time we're in town, come lead the choir. Talk to me. The, the song we're going to uh, do first. By the way, we're here to celebrate a lot of things. That Metallic is in the studio. Also, there's a new 3D film. I've seen the film, and uh, it's very hard to describe. It's called Through the Never. While I, I don't want to say it's entirely a concert film because. There's some kid in there getting the shit beaten out of him and all kinds of crap going on. But I get it. I was in the audience. We were all punching each other during the Metallica show. It got really weird on uh, Saturday night. Like guys were, like Richard uh, is your biggest fan. You know him. He he um, he was wearing a diaper because he didn't want to miss anything. So he pisses he into here? the diaper and he's drinking. <laughs> Richard, did you know that? Yeah. Where, is he here? Yeah, he's here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I promised him he could watch you guys play one. But <laughs> okay. um, um, to me, one is anti-war, of course, right? I mean, what what are we talking about here? You guys have a lot of military themes in your music. There's a lot of stuff about war. And yet I feel it's the band is very sort of anti-war. Am I correct? You you might be correct in a few members. <laughs> no, are, I think Are you split uh 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 politically? Uh I don't I don't know. We don't we don't really discuss that too much cuz politics and religion separate people, I think. And we're about bringing people together, really. Well, you you guys, uh, I, I get from your music that you feel religion is sort of a joke. Well, yeah. First, it, it's all up to the person, man. I'm all about freedom, yes. pretty much. And if you know, war is a part of man. As simple as that. We're just writing about it, good or bad. You know, just writing about it. It's not good or bad. It's just a thing. Uh, to me, the song one is where I first started to get to know you guys because of the video and all that kind of stuff. And the thought of a guy locked in his body. I mean, the guy has no senses. Where, where did this song... First of all, how do you start writing a song about all this? My brother, uh, older brother Dave, who was... Uh, he also played in a band... Uh, played drums. He, uh, I don't know, he told me a story about, I guess, some, some he was, uh, 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 whatever, reading a book, which was Johnny Got His Gun, right. telling me about this guy who, yeah, he was like a prisoner in his own body. And I related to that because I felt that. Not that I couldn't speak or, or hear or use my limbs, but 
for some reason I connected with that, like being stuck in your own skin and how uncomfortable that can feel. And that would be like the ultimate hell where you can't communicate to anybody. So the song is about a guy who's trapped inside his own body. He has no arms, he has no legs, he can't taste, he can't see, he can't smell. Or talk. Or and in a way, you felt like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of your, your, you had a miserable childhood. When I read about your childhood, I think, I don't even know how you survived that in a sense. Well, uh, and, and the, the crazy thing is, you know, I, I grew up thinking that it was just normal. And I think I'm not the You thought the your only childhood one. was normal? Yeah, pretty because much. Because how would you know otherwise? Exactly. Your father left when uh, you were what? Six, 13. 13. Yeah. He leaves, and you never hear from the guy again, right? I mean, pretty much. He didn't support the family. He did not. Right. He, and your mom, she died shortly thereafter of cancer, right? Yeah, a few years later. So you were basically orphaned. Yeah. Did it drive you insane that your father, even after your mother died, didn't get in touch with you? He did try to get in touch with me. I, I really wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, I, I it was a, it was a, you know, I, I'm, there's a movie that, that I've been interviewed for, which is called Absent, about right. fathers and uh, the, the absence of a uh, male role model in a lot of children's lives and how, imp how that impacts uh, their upbringing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've come to a lot of closure with all that stuff. You know, my dad did his best. I understand that. Uh, did it he wasn't though, enough. Did he do his best? I guess that's it all anyone enough. can do. Exactly. Right. Yeah. He, he had no father either. So if you trace it back, there's you can make sense of it all. So you, And you're a pretty good dad, right? I'm doing my best. So I'm saying you had no role model. You probably had to go learn all this stuff about how to be a dad. Fear of not being a good dad, is a, it's a real fear that guys just don't want to talk about. And yeah. it's okay to put it out there, you know? Because I don't know hard. what I'm doing, you, you know? You don't. And so how do you get lessons on how to be a dad if you don't have one that even showed you how to be one? Right. Well, you ask your friends. Yeah. And asking is sometimes tough. <laughs> that is Because it shows uh, transparency and realness, and you want to look like you're the macho dude and know what you're doing. Yeah. It, it, probably admitting that you don't know what you're doing is probably the best thing in the world. And it's the best thing for the kids to hear, actually. Yeah. Your life got even wackier because your mom was a, um, a what do you call it, a Christian scientist or something? She didn't believe mm -hmm. in any medications. Right. And that's right. probably, I thought, where most of your anger came from. That, Absolutely. That y your mom was saying, hey, um, I'm dying of cancer. I don't want any medicine. And yeah. people would say, D uh, no medicine. And that's probably, you, you, in your mind, you thought, well, if you take some medicine, mom, maybe you'd still be around. Yeah. It drives yeah. you crazy, I, right? Well, uh, and, but she wouldn't even admit that she had cancer. I mean, that was the whole, the whole, the whole religion itself uh, didn't make much sense to me. That if even if you, even if me and my sister mentioned, "Mom, you look sick," then that is admitting it, and that is going to let the, the thing in that actually kills her. So we can't be a part of. You know, I don't want to kill my mom. It's, it's like all well, magic. Watching her die. Yeah. It's magical magic. yeah. thinking. It's crazy. And in day and age when they had drugs and things mm -hmm. that could help keep people alive, she wouldn't go to a hospital or anything like that. Right, right. So that's why when we hear this song, one, we're not just talking about a guy who's had his limbs cut off and had his senses all, you know, and he's locked inside his head. It's very much you who had, you know, you were cut off from the rest of the world in a sense and mm -hmm. very alone. You're the guy with his limbs cut off. Wow. All right, now play that song and don't cry. <laughs> Have you ever cried How during... How much do I owe you for this therapy session? Do you, did you cry when you wrote this song? Because sometimes when I hear it, I, I'm almost on the verge of tears. I really am. That's great. That's great. It I touches me. I did not. Now, now I might. Thanks. All right. <laughs> this is the song one done live in our little studio right now. And uh, Richard, if you want, since you had a schmega mustache, you could sit on the couch and don't freak these guys out. <laughs> Where is he? Uh, he, he? He freaks us out. How is he not going to freak them? Out? Well, Did, Lars, you're the reason Richard started drumming, by the way. <laughs> Does he, he have smegma? Hey, Richard. Yeah, how's the the you still got the smell of smegma oh, yeah, on you, yeah. dude? Or what? I wash my face with scalding hot water yeah. to get rid of the smegma. I wish you guys could have seen him at your concert. First of all, he can't move his neck now because he's fucking... He's, he, he, there was more, like, there was, the concert was more about him than you guys. <laughs> I was getting into it. And by the way, I cry during shit. one every time. You do cry. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try not to now because I don't want to look like a pussy in front of these guys. But <laughs> I can almost cry right now just thinking that I'm in the room with them. Oh, so. my goodness. Well, tell, well, tell, tell Lars about why you started drumming. 
For, well, sure. Because of Lars. I mean, when I heard Kill 'em All, and, and you taught me how to play double bass from the one video, the shot of you playing heels up behind. I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's how you do it. And so well, I owe you. everything to you. Yeah. You want to come sit over here? You know, he actually wants to play mm. during this. <laughs> <laughs> he owes everything to Lars. Lars, he lived in a, what was it? A, a, a storage, storage unit. locker. Yeah, he lived in a storage unit. For, what band were you in? For 12 years. What band were Charred you in? Walls of the Damned. We played yeah. Orion Fest last year. Uh, yeah, That's yeah, right, yeah. 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 All right, well, right. well shut the guy, up. Enough about Howard, you, Metallica. The guy, that, the guy that gave us our first record deal, Brian Slagle, way back in, in 83, is also the uh -huh. label that you guys are on, mm -hmm. right? He yeah. was there Saturday night. There's yeah. a connection. Yeah, and the big difference is he oh. sold one album and you sold millions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real big difference, but that's the only difference. All right. That's where it starts, though. Yeah. Here's the song. This is called One.
Richard's diaper is full. <laughs> you like that, you prick? Oh, that, diaper. Yeah. that was oh, the greatest thing God. ever. That is beautiful. <laughs> Tell me how you write a song like that, because I want to write a song like that. What happens? Now, Now, what is the... the, the Lars, do you... What happens there, James? How do you write that song? Uh, <laughs> what is that? Like, what's the process? Do you have that in Lock your head? Lock yourself in a garage for a while, and uh, who comes up with the music? I think, uh, boy, I don't remember that part, uh, that song. I think we all just remember. put riffs together as we go through life. We have riffs, and we have a riff tape, and we pick out the best riff, and. Uh, we slap them together. And how and do you come up with the lead on vocal on that? Because it's, I mean, when I hear that, I, I wouldn't even know where to jump in and start singing. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I mean, uh, who, write, who writes most of the lyrics? Me. It's a, it's, a, it's a melody thing. Yeah. Okay. When you write those lyrics, do you write them in a room by yourself? Or do you sit there and wait for the riffs? Yeah, great question. Sometimes uh, there's poetry that's written. Sometimes uh, just certain lines come up. Uh, uh, that are strong enough to start an idea. Right. Uh, and other times it's, here's the music, uh, I know the melody, fill in the blanks. So it's like a puzzle. So did you have, when you were a kid, did you have poetry books? Did you read poetry? Not at all. Not at no. all? Because you don't strike me as the poetry thing. You, you strike me as a guy who's like beating people up and shit and fighting and stuff. You know what I mean? You don't strike me as the poetry type. I was not beating people up. But that were you shocked? Kind of the other way. You, you were busy getting beaten up. <laughs> yeah, mentally. But that was your... But he that was, was really your, shy. Your dad shy. physically beat James you up. James was though, really, right? really shy. Yeah, there was, there was, you know, that was a whole other generation of, of uh, discipline. But for me, getting into a room and kind of closing off is, is where it happens. And a lot of times when I I think I want I'm you know going somewhere with a lyric it'll take you somewhere else and it's that's the beauty of it you don't really know where it's going do you think that the, your teachers would be surprised that you became a lyricist someone who could write lyrics there's no doubt about that yeah because <laughs> probably no one had you pegged for that no not and, at and all. were you even shocked that all this came out of you all this poetry yeah I learned a lot from music from other musicians from other uh, uh, you know people that were writing lyrics you know uh, there's there were singers that I admired there were people that I uh, that I liked their lyrics maybe not liked their music uh, um, but I have since you know continued to discover uh, different lyricists that I enjoy so when you wrote nothing else matters mm -hmm. which is considered uh, a softer song a ballad really mm -hmm. right yeah you were embarrassed to bring that to the band right because not only are you a shy person, but also it was a love song to a girlfriend at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when you so, would you have buried that song rather than bring it to them? And how did it end up in the band's hands? I think Lars heard it and said, "Hey, that's really good." And I said, "No, it's not." <laughs> how did Lars hear that song? If you were ashamed of it, how did you hear it? You played it for me. <laughs> that's how he heard it. So you weren't <laughs> that. So you weren't that ashamed. And did, it, Lars, did he come to you? Did James come to you and go, "Hey, man"? I'm gonna play something for you. I no, know. I mean it's always been a, there's always been a very open door policy. I mean we all trade. Usually, what would happen back in the early days is that uh, when we would after a tour go on break, like James would give me all his uh, ideas, Kurt would give me all his ideas. We'd all sort of trade ideas, and then we'd go away. And then when we'd start writing uh, a few months later, everybody would kind of have an idea of what everybody else was bringing to the table. What a weird process. You're almost like the guy everyone sort of dumps all their ideas into, and you've got to organize the ideas? Is that it? Um, He's the only organized guy in this band. He, he, right. he, he's <laughs> best suited for that job. He's best suited for that job. But, he's but, our manager. So, but Lars, I mean, when you think about mm. Lars and James, right? You think about two guys from opposite ends of the world. You totally. think about Lars was a, a, from a wealthy family, tennis uh, playing family, the whole thing. And then you see James, in a way, go, you know, just kind of like in this shitty situation with his parents. The idea that you two guys got together is insane, right? That the whole band found each other is insane. Well, I think we found something in each other that we're missing. I mean, you know, I found, uh, you know, I grew up an only child and found, you know, a, my best friend, found a brother and found somebody who could relate to everything that I was going through. And James at that time, like we said, was painfully shy and kind of in his own world. Everything about being in a band and I think hard rock at that time was about belonging to something bigger than yourself. What keeps and you guys together, though, do you think? Do you, do you, do you think that it's that uh, even through the... Like, you guys had some shitty times together. You had some good times together. Are you real brothers? Do you think the band will always be together? Is there any way this band could ever break up? I think that's why we're still together. We've gone through fire together. 
And uh, do you still once, see each other socially, or no? It do, it doesn't go that way. I don't know. Uh, When's the last time you guys all hung socially, out socially? You mean yes, going out mean. and hanging out? <laughs> like and when you're like, not hey, let's working. Let's get our families together. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't think that happens too often. I think we 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 know, we respect each other and their and our and our privacy and our boundaries with our families. We get together for parties at HQ. You know the. The Halloween party at HQ is kind of the most awesome time with all the kids together. But I think we've stayed together because of that honesty and the fact that, you know, like in the Some Kind of Monster movie, we walk through fire. And That's true. we know that we can conquer anything. Anything that comes at us, we've we've kind of been through it, you know? It's amazing. And we care for it. And there is that fifth member, like Lars was talking about earlier. Yeah, we're not, uh, you know, I'm not in the best singer poll. I'm not, you know, we're not individually amazing musicians but together the fifth member is uh, a force that you need to reckon with so the song nothing else matters mm-hmm. in a weird way James, yeah let, let me tell you something what if you, i said to you that this song could possibly be james's song to lars what do you think of that very true it's Very a love true. song to your brother Lars. Yeah. It, 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 you probably didn't know that when you were writing it. You yeah. think you were writing no, it for I'm a woman. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> you have to tur- turn <laughs> face you. You have yeah. to turn around and face me while you're singing. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a beautiful love song that no, really I mean, came to really came to be because yeah. a Lars, you gave James the confidence to release well, this like, song. I, I said I just True. you know when I heard it, it, it was in a. A kind of a, a rough state. Uh, the, all the parts on it now weren't there, but when I heard the verses, I'd never heard James sing like that, and it just moved me. And I knew that this was something that we had to share with the rest of the world. He felt, uh, I think, too vulnerable at that time to sort of let that out there, but I knew that um, this was something that had to be shared with everybody. The woman you wrote this song for, did she know you wrote it for her? Does she have any idea, or you never told her? I think so, maybe. She knew. But it's gone way beyond that. You know, I, people come up to us and say, we used it at our wedding, we this and that. I mean, the, the Hells Angels had it in a little movie that they put together. So it is about brotherhood as well. And it, and it's vague enough to relate to everything and, and, and needing and needing another human, you know? All right. Here we go. Don't get for nervous. For Lars. This is for Lars. <laughs> Much more from the heart 
forever trust in who we are No, nothing else matters Never care for what they do Never care for what they know Cause I know decide which guy takes the lead between you and Kirk how do you like like you guys trade off right he does it what do you mean he does it how he's do you better decide? what do you mean he's better you think he's a better guitar player than you yeah no you know actually what happens is uh, whoever has a a, a a better feel for for uh, the, the part usually dictates who's gonna play the solo but a lot of times James just like uh, defers to me because he likes rocking out and playing rhythm guitar on stage. You're not comfortable playing lead? <laughs> and not having to worry about, uh, not having to think too much about it. <laughs> so he leaves it to me. I don't Kirk. like playing lead. I like writing leads. I like melody. I love playing the melodies. I love working out the harmonies and things. Yes. But actually playing them. You don't enjoy it. Uh, You'd rather hand that off to Kirk. I would. Kirk, why do you honor White Zombie? he's the ripper. On your uh, guitar, you have a sticker for White Zombie, the band. No, actually, it's the movie White Zombie from 1932. Oh, so you're not honoring uh, Rob Zombie's no, band no, White Zombie? No, no, has nothing to do with Rob Zombie at all. It's just a, a, a movie that I really like. I'm, I'm a, a big horror movie fan. I also have a mummy guitar that has the mummy on it. Speaking of guitars, James, you play a black guitar. I, I mean, I'm into the aesthetic also of a band. Does it matter to you what a guitar looks like? Does, well, that, does that factor into it? For, well, for uh, me, a guitar has to look good, sound good, and play good. 
Right. But, uh, James, the guitar you were playing has, like, an iron cross on it. It's a black guitar. And I saw that. I go, that's the coolest fucking guitar I ever saw. Does that matter to you what it looks like? Sure. It yeah. does, right? Yeah, I, I, I like having a guitar that looks pretty cool. Yeah, what was that guitar, the black one with the cross on it? The Iron Cross. Yeah. yeah that's that, the Iron Cross. It's guitar. called the Iron Cross guitar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and do you have a favorite guitar? Uh, I would say this one, the Snake Bite. The Snake Bite. Snake Bite. It kind of looks like a retro kind of look, right? The guitar. Well, it's like an explorer shape, but with uh, it's thinner, it's lighter, it's uh, it's got some barbs on it, like the Metallica logo, and uh, the explorer shape just hangs on me well. It's 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 just a feel thing. It's a and feel. I can sit down and play, you know, with the thing. So it is about feel. And Lars, you uh, knew that song was going to be a hit. You had an argument with the record I was, company. It wasn't, it wasn't so much about a hit. It was just more about a side of Metallica that I was really proud of and I thought that everybody should see. Were you scared that the fans would revolt when they heard such no. a beautiful ballad? No, I think it's good to challenge the fans once in a while, actually. It, it doesn't matter to you. Talk to me about this movie. Why put out a movie now? And who convinced you to do this? I like the movie because I feel I've never seen a musical performance recorded that beautifully. What is it, a special technique that they record this thing with? I'm talking about the sound and the, and the look. Well, we, we asked our director, you know, most concert films are shot from the outside. Yes. Looking, looking at the band, we wanted the guy to shoot it from the inside so you really feel like you're up on stage with Metallica, which I think is what you're talking about, that yeah. you're really part of what's going on in the trenches. You're being spit on, you're being sweated on, you're really right there with the band. And so his marching orders were get up on stage, bring your cameras up there and shoot out. So you really, you know, you, you sort of, there's shots behind James, behind Rob. Right, the idea is that into, I feel like I'm in the band. Exactly. I'm yeah. playing with you guys. Exactly. Yeah, I got that from the film. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Those were the marching orders. And Greg Fiddleman, who has been doing all our sound stuff for the better part of the last five years, did all the, the, the audio and just stepped it up. We had the premiere in San Francisco, what, a week or two ago and on the big IMAX screen out there, and it sounded just fucking next level. Now, how I mean, nervous are you guys about a movie coming out that's a Metallica movie? I'm talking about from a commercial sense. I mean, you don't. I don't care how successful you are and how much money you made. You always want a project to be commercially successful, yes? Yeah. It's a risk to do a movie. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Who decide, Who Did anyone in the band say, let's not do this? Why should we put ourselves through that kind of pressure? Yeah. There was a time when we were really scared about it. I know at least Lars and I had, had we freaked out. It's like, you're going to have a 3D movie of us up there in this theater? It's like, who right. wants to see that? <laughs> I, you know, uh, we, we've seen U2. We've seen uh, The Stones. We've seen, okay, it's there for a minute. I watched it. Done. That's right. it. How is this thing going to have any legs whatsoever, you know? It's flattering to the ego, though, isn't it? I mean, to see yourself in IMAX and all of that, but at the same point, it's like, who the fuck needs this pressure? Now there's a movie studio. That's, how much money does it cost to make a movie like that? I imagine it's right. very expensive. Yeah, sure it is. A couple I mean, of million bucks, right? The movie world is a whole nother level. So for us, getting the narrative in there was very important, and, and I know all of us, you know, we've seen ourselves thousands of times on video and whatnot. We wanted to see the narrative. We wanted more narrative, more story, more, uh, uh, you know, more of Dane DeHaan. Yeah, I like that you broke up the movie with uh, a guy and a story and, and, and something going on. It reminded me of the old music videos where you see a little well, just, action yeah, going on. Right. to try to put a different spin on it. I mean, it was, uh, you know, all these other concert movies and these documentaries and we don't need to mention names but they become more like infomercials it's like here we mm -hmm. are getting in and out of a plane and here we are getting in and out of a limo and right. here we are folding you know lunch meat on a sandwich and all this stuff and mention names of bands who have done that that you find <laughs> sellouts and we just felt that Metallica we don't need to do that so what else mm -hmm. can you do we'll put a story in there and so you know we found you know the, the, the greatest you know uh, actor of his generation in Hollywood you know Dane DeHaan and how do you find that kid he just, I mean, there was a, a couple, three years ago, there was a movie called Chronicle. Never mind just, Chronicle. Uh, remember that kid on um, In Treatment? Yeah, did you, treatment. See, did yeah, you watch yeah, that yeah. show? The HBO show, yeah. The kid was good. Yeah, Does he come and meet Metallica, and you guys have to approve him as the guy who gets his ass kicked all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> he actually met with our director first, and the two of them hit it off. You know, it was a very difficult script to read because you've written movie scripts, and 
there's basic there's no dialogue in the film so he was right. handed a 15 page script with no dialogue and he sat there trying to make heads and tails of it and he finally <laughs> met our director yes and there's tons of violence which I think goes it's weird with your band it goes hand in hand I gotta see a guy getting his fucking ass kicked I gotta see car crashes and I gotta see blood and you did provide all of that and fire Don't why is fire. that why is that we just need it right you know, I was thinking about uh, Blitzkrieg, if I may mention this for a second. I'm, I'm in the gym the other day, and uh, I've told people this, and I'm ashamed of it. When I bench press, I bench 90 pounds. Now, but that's 10 times. <laughs> Suddenly, this song comes on, and I'm, be that's right, I'm benching about 100. I added 10 pounds to the uh, stack. It gets you fucking charged up. Look at that. Fuck you. I'll kick your ass. Right now, who wants to fight? <laughs> don't you think your songs... That's something, Howard. <laughs> don't you think your songs inspire violence in a weird way? They have to, right? You have to beat the shit out of somebody when you're listening to them. <laughs> our, our, songs, well, our songs have a lot of adrenaline... Well, they yeah. have a lot of aggression, and they, they, they cause a lot of adrenaline to flow. Yeah, I was punching Because that's guy. what, when, when fighter pilots well sometimes put. are getting ready, that's what they're blasting in their ears what so was, that they can get ready to go do what they have to do. Sports figures, yeah, everyone says. Yeah. What was the, uh, the, uh, the, the classic thing? The military was using Metallica music to torture prisoners with, right? And you guys well, put the, the Iranians, the, 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 the Iraqis, uh, Muslim. or something. I don't know who, who were they torturing. Well, the who were we fighting were with? The, the Afghanis. <laughs> who, who were we killing at that moment? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what I'm saying is, you guys, how do you put a stop to that when when the military starts using your your music to torture people? How do you put a stop? To yeah, you, you guys did. Do you we stop do? it? We really didn't do anything. I mean, <laughs> it seems like it's you know once your music is out there. It's, you don't have you don't, control. It's not yours anymore yeah. so much. You know, obviously with the internet, you know, it's... Uh, Does it bother I mean, you to hear it that it it's being used for torture? We've I, been you torturing wanted... our fans for years. <laughs> I have. I had a great fantasy. Some torturing dude... My, our, uh, our friends and family with it. I had a great fantasy when I heard that story. And this, the fantasy I, I had was, so you guys, your music is playing, and they're torturing some guy, and this guy hears it, and he gets turned on to metal music, and it starts a whole new genre of metal in some oh, yeah. of these Muslim countries, you know, where they're not Torture even allowed. Metal. Torture, Torture metal. Torture metal. And it do starts. have a big following in Iran. <laughs> Is no that right? About that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we, we played a couple times over in um, in Abu Dhabi and in that area there. I mean, there are uh -huh. a lot of kids over there that are really, really, really passionate about this kind of music they come in we played in abu dhabi they come in from iran they come in from iraq they come in from saudi lebanon. from lebanon wow. Syria. crazy and they're it? so passionate and they're so it's so beautiful to see like all the flags out in the audience and and see a, a kind of a unity for a couple hours in, a, in an area that has so much turmoil isn't and it the fact that, that we can bring that music and help inspire that unity is really really cool isn't it wonderful to think that you guys who were like you know living in your living in your shithole fucking car or something <laughs> and like the thing has Eating gotten hamburger helper aren't you glad you stuck with it how many times did you almost quit the business honestly not not many really because you had not, no choice. No, what the fuck would you have been much. doing? What else are we going to do? Yeah. 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 We had no choice. You had no but choice. Also, I mean, you well, got to remember. Breaking bones, catching on fire, you know, but people you gotta, screaming the F word in your face. You so, know. Someone said. But you got to remember, though, when you're, when you're at that time, when we were living 30 years ago, and we could feed, you know, there was a Burger King next to where we lived. And for buck ninety nine, we could go in and do five guys on the salad bar because <laughs> we'd sneak in and out of the back door. <laughs> and, but at that they time, must have loved you at Burger King. Yeah, yeah. But at that time, you don't know anything different. Do you right. know what I mean? So it's like it's it's the unity. It's the do you miss mentality. those days? No. Um, it's a lot I'm, more fun with money, right? Back then, there was, yeah, it, it doesn't was, matter. It, it, doesn't, it matter. doesn't matter. It wasn't better or worse. Money was, lets it, us make a movie, dude. But, I mean, but dude, did amazing. you ever look at your friends who were all starting to settle down and you sit, and before you really even had any success and you, things were going horribly? Did you ever look at it and go, "Oh my God, what? Where am I going to be in fifteen years when I have no no money? And what if I end up like one of these bands that don't make it?" Hmm. You know, 
It didn't matter. matter whatsoever. Yeah. You were that fun. Wow. Us going to Burger King and sharing the the salad plate. We thought we were we were happening. And look we at look we at look look smart. just look at the last three days of our lives. Right, on on Saturday we were at the Apollo. Yesterday we were at Yankee Stadium. How was that? Mariano. And today we're here with you. I mean, we're fucking living the dream still. Thirty two <laughs> years later. Some people have said that Metallica almost broke up when um, you guys saw my ass cheeks at the uh, when I was Fart Man at the MTV. That Awards. was a bad yeah, moment. A, <laughs> <laughs> a low point. That, 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 that was shocking. That. I have to say, Howard, that was quite a shock. Uh, I am so ashamed <laughs> that I did that, especially in front of you guys. I had no fucking. I was out of my fucking mind, is what it was. Well, we, it, it was. We, we knew you were going to. We've come, all had make moments. an appearance, but we didn't know you were make that kind of. A you appearance. didn't. Was that when right. you came in on the wire? Well, I came in on the yeah, wire. You know, yeah. I almost yeah. lost my fingers that night because the wire was twisting. The reason that I feel bad about it, honestly, I didn't understand the history of the band, and it was the first time you guys were being honored at the MTV Awards. And it really did mean something to you because, you know, you guys really had struggled. And and there I am with my ass cheeks while you're making a heartfelt speech. And I think, Lars, you put your foot up my asshole. I think I had anal with you. Uh, you know what I mean? Were you guys anal pissed afterwards or were you okay with it? I was like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> well, you're a fan of monster movies. What's more hideous than my ass? Let's be honest. Talk so, about horror. The movie... The Metallica new 3D uh, film, and you really got to see this thing. Metallica uh, through the never. And if, if you're a fan, and even if you're not a fan of Metallica, you will not believe the quality of this film and the fact that you will feel like you are in a rock band. Uh, the way they shot it. How many cameras are uh, used in something like this? Is there like 16, 17 cameras? No, or you have no concept? It was a lot. O <laughs> was over a lot 30. Over 30 cameras, I think. Wow. I mean, we, and these we are 3D a movie. cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. We filmed a movie and brought the crowd in, and it, it was all about the movie first and, and making yeah. it the most intense and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, the experience of you being on stage, like you were saying. Um, and then all of the footage with Dane is, is high intensity. Yeah, it's pretty cre incredible. And like I, when I was watching you guys Saturday night, I was really genuinely jealous, like envious that I couldn't be up on a stage in a band and I'm really going to take some guitar lessons now and I'm going to get started. By the time I'm 90, I should have my band in full force. You know what I mean? It's never too late, man. Hey, hey, James, why are you the only guy with tattoos in the band? What is, what is that? Kurt's got some. He does? Well, he hides them, though. I was It was upsetting me that there was yeah, more I... ink on stage uh, during uh, the show. You were upset? I was. I was like, you know, I, I think the other guy should get more ink. Lars, what about you getting some ink? Uh, you know what? These two guys make up for it. I, I don't need tattoos. And I don't have Lars Let's have a band tattoo. Mix. Come on. Come on. James, <laughs> are you sorry you're so heavily tattooed? Do you like your tattoos? You know, there's no regrets in my life. It all, all stuff happened for a reason. And, you know, I love art. I love what's on here. Sometimes uh, I wonder what it would be like if they weren't there, but they're there. And the meanings change behind them as life goes on, too. What, 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 as a dad, are you going to let your kids get tattooed? Or they, do they ever come to... How old are your kids? Uh, 11, 13, 15. So when uh, the 15-year-old says, I'm going to go get some tattoos, do you say... Uh, can you put your foot down and say, no, that's not acceptable? Yeah, sure. When you're 18, make your own choices. Uh, but until then, we're we're guardians of you and keeping you safe. You have your own path, but... Uh, when did you, you get 18? your first tattoo? Uh, 36. Seven, maybe. Really? Maybe. Really? It was late. Or is it that was something late. we're just telling the kids? <laughs> <laughs> do you? No, uh, it do was you? Late. You don't watch the MTV Awards, do you guys? You you don't watch those, do you? Did you watch Miley Cyrus or any is of MTV that? MTV still on? It's still on. Believe it or not, they have awards and stuff. Do you got? You guys? They do pay, have awards. Do you yeah. pay attention to the charts at all? Do you pay attention to what's selling in pop music? Me personally, no. I'm not sure about the other guys. I definitely do not. You do not care. I don't. Why? You sound like you're sickened by it all. Are you? <laughs> Well, you know, it's just uh, I, uh, the future is uh, in 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 music. It's it's hard to find stuff that uh, that really gets me excited about the future. Of, don't of, you? Don't also, you? I mean, two two things changed over the years. Number one, satellite radio, and number two, the iPod. So now when you're in your car, all I listen to is either satellite radio or my iPod. I don't really listen to commercial radio anymore. So you you, you sort of stop paying attention. You know? Yeah, you, in, you in, do. In our car, it's in a our great car, great ad for Sirius right there, Lars. There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But, yeah. but every morning, every morning, it's a it's a race you know, between the kids on the school grinder who can you know hijack the iPod first or you know whatever channel on 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 the satellite and it's it's just commercial radio is a non-entity i think but don't days. you even say to yourself thank god i'm not a band coming up now you cannot sell Absolutely. albums now and you guys were right about napster i do believe that i always backed you on that i know you took a lot of shit for it 
But a band cannot make money with their music anymore. You can't sell albums. Am I correct or not? There's bands that are they're they're trying. They're doing their best, and but they're there's not selling new ways. Up. It's getting creative. There's there's new ways, and I think if we were a band coming up now, we'd do our best, and that's all you would do. And uh, uh, these bands are passionate about what they do, so but they'll they can't, find a way. But they can't break through on a large scale like Metallica did. Do your kids love music? Yes, they do. Do you spank cool. them when they listen to some of this shit? Do you teach them <laughs> yeah. that? Uh, spank them. What, is, what, is get, what do they get pull spanked over. for? I'm, I'm throwing you out of the house for listening to this shit. I think the next generation, they have to have their own music, man. They they got to. I You know, I loved it when my parents hated my music. That's right. just a part of it, man. Th that's what it is. Yeah. We are celebrating your movie today. We are celebrating Metallica. Woo. What an honor to have you guys in here playing like this. Right you back are, at you, man. It, it right is back just at you. fucking Likewise. great. The new this 3D so cool. film is so great. It's uh, Through the Never. You saw it, right, Richard? Tell the fans what you thought of it. I was moshing in my chair, like going nuts and <laughs> smacking people next to me and just going crazy. It was awesome. The sound, I can't wait. To, there's an album coming out too, right? Yep. Like with the movie, the sound was perfect. That's like right. the production was, and and it's so loud in the theater too. It was really like you're in a a concert. It was awesome. Also, there's a Metallica channel on Sirius, which Woo! I think so is fantastic, cool. because I can pump iron to it. Do you, you pumping iron all day? I'm pu <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going to get in some shape. You will. <laughs> you know, it, it, because it, you know, also, it, you know, you, in a band, it, it doesn't matter how you look, too, right? You got to work out, right? You got to physically take care of yourself. You guys play very hard. I don't think it's for the week, right? Well, for us, we we stay in shape, not so much to look good, but to sort of be able to do it. It's the physicality right. of what we do that we have to be respectful to. So, I think we're all in better shape now than we've ever been because we eat well, we work out, and and we sort of respect it. We have uh, Jeff and a couple other guys that massages and stretches and put us back really? together after we. Has anyone it. become a vegetarian? You did, Kirk. <laughs> I, uh, I, I last time I ate, I ate red meat was in 1985. Because the James, right, the made, tour. He James gave made fun of Axl Rose and said he looks like a vegetarianism <laughs> or something like that. And remember, you did that. I eat only meat. You only no. eat meat. Yeah. Raw meat. Well, this band is fantastic. <laughs> uh, for more information, go to throughthenevermovie.com. I wish you a lot of luck with it. It's something spectacular to be proud of. Thank you. Uh, and you boys are going to honor us with one last song. <clears throat> Let's talk about this song. This song is called Enter Sandman. This is really about horrible dreams. Yes, nightmares as a kid. Nightmares as a yeah. kid. And who could blame you for having nightmares as a kid? <laughs> and nobody came when you had a nightmare, did they? Did anyone Not comfort so you much. ever? Yeah, I got comfort, yeah. You got did you? Uh, Lars yeah. did. There he is. What did you do to comfort him? <laughs> Let me sleep at his house. Let me come over yeah, he came, and uh, uh, record all his records and he came, learn about music. He spent a lot there. of time at my house when we started hanging out. It was... Uh, we just hung out in my room for the first two years or something and listened to music. And Do you think that's why you wish, like, Lars almost, like, I don't want to say he stood in for your father or your family, but he became your family, <laughs> right? That's not such a weird thought when you think about it. No. You, I mean, you had, you had a lot of brothers and sisters, though, didn't you? I had two older brothers and a younger sister. And a younger sister. What are yeah. they doing now? Are they in a band? They're not in a band. The, my, my, my brother Dave, who, uh, who was in a band... He got back together with his buddies for his 60th birthday, and he invited me along to play with him. It was a huge moment. It was very cool. And, you know, learning, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix and some of the old 60s stuff that they used to play, it was a lot of fun. Did so you uh, do an homage to Jimi Hendrix Saturday night at the Apollo when you got down on your knees? And Was that it? Was that the... No, you played Kirk, Jimi Kirk Hendrix. Yeah, Kirk yeah, played uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, well, I found out that, that Jimi Hendrix won a talent show or amateur talent show there in 1964. Yeah. Oh, is that why you played that? Yeah. Rah, nah, 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 yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, nah. I play a little bit of Voodoo Child because I was feeling I was feeling the spirit of Jimmy there on that stage for sure. You have to tell the rest of the band you're going to do that ahead of time before uh, you start you know, doing that. I don't know if I mentioned it or not. I just it just of, comes up. It, it just did. Well, I was I was feeling it. And, and I thought James was doing an homage when you got down on your knees. I thought you were going to light your fucking guitar on fire or something. You were, <laughs> it almost looked like the Woodstock. Me on fire, but that's been done before. Was that an homage to uh, Jimmy? Or no, no, I fell down. You just fell down. Okay, yeah. that's it. I was tired. So this song is about nightmares. When you when you're a child, nightmares occur. Right. 
And uh, that's it. I mean, what what more needs to be said about this song, right? Right. Well, I mean, the, that that uh, I, I think the whole thing of wanting to comfort your child, wanting to to keep them safe from everything, but when they go to sleep, you can't you can't keep them safe. There, there's stuff that enters their mind or that that's creating you know whatever subconscious that you can't save them from. So at that point, when you're a kid, you have to start standing up for yourself and you've got to battle the world even in, in your dreams how long to write this song do you remember hmm. writing it it took a while because i think the original lyrics for this were were about something else it was about family but what was it about lars uh, <laughs> it was about a dysfunctional family really right. so it, but why it is morphed. lars laughing at that <laughs> why because you didn't like that, the original no that's putting it mildly saying dysfunctional family <laughs> it was uh my recollection was it was about crib death Crib death. Oh, a song about crib death. That's dysfunctional, isn't it? <laughs> oh, fuck. Did you say no to wisdom. James, hey, I don't think we should write a song about crib death? <laughs> about crib death. D did you well, say I that mean, to what, him? What happened? What happened? Would the story be different? Really? <laughs> I'd like well, to hear the original lyric. Would not be here because of that? I would like to hear the original lyric. <laughs> Bob, so Rock, I, Bob Rock, Bob Rock, and I looked at each other and went, hmm. Uh, maybe we should chat with James. I go, why don't you chat with James? <laughs> so, <laughs> and he uh, went and said, hey, James, crib death is kind of a, a little too out there. Well, it, uh, I mean, it's we're not dark, so much about, too not, dark. It was not so much about the commercial elements. It was just more, it was like whether that was the the, the, the fitting vibe for the music. Right. Uh, the, the music for uh, Enter Sandman was the first. We did four records, and they got each more and more progressive along the way and Justice for All was like this ultimate in 10 minute songs and songs that were all over the place and so we sat down afterwards and wanted to try to simplify a little bit and Inner Sandman was the first song that we wrote we wrote it literally like in a day Wow! and um, it seemed like um, the lyrics were not super fitting to the simplicity of the music do you remember um, the original title was it Enter Sandman or was it something else um no, I don't think it was titled. I don't think the song was ever titled until right at the very end. Um, yeah, a lot of the songs aren't titled till the yeah. end. It's like it's like naming your dog, or you know, or uh, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, until you find out the character of it, yeah. then you can name it. Yeah. It's like it's a nickname for the song. You know? Will you ever go back and write a song about crib death? Do you think I will that, now? You will yeah, now. Or bring back those now. lyrics. Yeah. Please debut that here, if you I will. will. <laughs> Not on the Metallica channel. Yeah, don't lose those lyrics. We're celebrating the new 3D film Metallica through the Never. Here is a song that the boys leave you with, originally about crib death, <laughs> and now clean up a little bit. Take it away, boys.
Why, yes. I could do that all day. Watch you guys, I mean. Is that hard on your voice singing this early in the morning? Hell yeah. Hey, do, 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 is there a period of time that your voice has to recover? Because you, you sing hard. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Do you have to wait a couple of days between concerts? It is good nowadays to wait. Uh, you know, we don't do three in a row anymore. We don't do five shows in one week. Like because we why? You tore up your voice? Well, it would it would not sound great. And, you know, it's not sounding great this morning. But I think you will. You know, thank you. If I may say. Uh, but all of us, all of us need a little more time to recover. We're, uh, we're getting up there in age, and we're not afraid of it. We just need to care for it. You take vocal training? No. You do not? No. There are times when I uh, see a vocal coach. You know, me and Robert. You know, Robert has certainly stepped up, man. Yeah, Robert is doing more. I see he's, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's over there doing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah you're doing yeah. it, man. But one of the things when I, when I joined this band, I mean, I learned so much. It's like collaborating with them on new music and, and just even, like, getting into the backup vocal thing and I mean they've made me a better musician when you first joined the band didn't they fuck with you and like um, like you, you they know, didn't even put bass on one of the it's albums an interesting that you were on. thing I don't know if <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> <laughs> right wasn't that true guys wrong guy is it the wrong guy? What's the other guy? Wait, be the bass player in Metallica is not so lucky, is it? Well, it, I feel. I mean, <laughs> be like now with it, you know, they're embracing uh, the instrument, um, you know, like they haven't in many years. But uh, what what I wanted to say, this is an interesting little side Running story. Running office. Yes. Back in 1993, um, I, w I was touring in a band called Suicidal Tendencies, and we were opening yeah. for Metallica. Right. And and there was a end of tour party in Madrid, Spain. And I was sitting with Lars and James. We were drinking a bottle of Jägermeister. Little did I know, I drank the whole bottle of Jägermeister. I thought that I was drinking with them. Hey, Those were the days, shot. huh, James? Have <laughs> another shot. <laughs> yeah. So I always say that was uh, my christening uh, um, back Your in initiation? 1993. My yeah. initiation. Do you guys wear earplugs when you play? Do you wear something to protect your hearing? Because I've never heard a louder band in my life. I mean, it was fucking insane. Uh, do you wear something to protect your ears? We wear what's called in-ears. Uh, these little in-ear monitors. You have to, right? Yeah. Or else you'd go deaf. Oh, yeah. Pete Townsend's practically deaf from the who. I mean, he can't, he can't hear a thing. And probably in the beginning, you guys didn't wear any fucking ear shit, oh, right? Oh, no. Up where I was sitting um, uh, in front of uh, the monitor that had James's rhythm guitar, there was they measured like 125 dB up there, which is like the same level as a jet engine. Yeah, you guys are like and the I loudest sat, band I've ever heard. I in front of that for like 10 years. Oh. And I was on tour in Germany. I remember this clear... One night, uh, in the middle of the night, I went up and I was like, oh my God, something's fucked up. So I woke up, went over to turn the TV off, and it wasn't on. And then I realized, <laughs> wait a minute, maybe I should start dealing with So I started wearing earplugs. That was about 10 years in. Have you suffered hearing loss, any of you guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah I had the similar, similar experience that Lars has with uh, tinnitus. You yeah. Know, the, the Did you get the ringing? ringing? The ringing, yeah. You yeah. still get it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah I, yeah, I think the three of us have have had that for like the last 20 years or so. Tinnitus. Yeah. Oh, fuck tinnitus. Tini I thought it was tinnitus. <laughs> tinnitus. 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 Whatever it is. It Can sucks. they get rid of it? You mean you walk around? <laughs> you, wait a second. You guys walk around and you hear a ringing in your ears all the time? Yeah. Along with all the other voices. Yeah. And it gets worse if you're like uh, fatigued or under stress or any, or something like that. You know, what? It, 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 Thank it God just, we're not under it. It gets louder. <laughs> yeah. or ever fatigued. Lucky you have no stress in your life. Yeah. No, but seriously, louder. isn't that the most louder. annoying thing to walk around to hear that? I, I, do you get you, used to you it? Get used to it. I mean, it's it, it's sad, but you learn how to deal with it. The, the hardest thing for me is that you can never hear what other people are saying. Like if you're sitting in a restaurant and there's like a little bit of music in the background, a lot of trendy restaurants will have music. You, you gotta like lean in, you know, huh, what? Say that again, you gotta really, like start acting, I mean, I'm not making this up, you gotta sometimes like sit and really like concentrate on people's faces uh -huh. and their mouths and just see what they're saying. It is helps it, to yeah. be a little bit of a lip reader if you have tonight. But isn't that sad? You guys are such great musicians, it could come to the point where you can't hear your music. Right. I mean, you'll be like fucking I, I Beethoven or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was Beethoven. It was Beethoven. I think it's not getting worse. Yeah. I think we've sort of got it under, um, under, control, under control, but we do a lot of, uh, you know, we do some public service announcements and stuff with a company yeah. called Here and try to just sort of talk to people about, you know, what can happen. I mean, when I was a kid, I was, you know, 10, 12 years old. I remember we used to sit and have competitions with my friends. We'd put records on and we'd see who could have 
headphones on and have it on 10 for the longest period of time and oh. just nonsense like that so yeah. you just sit and talk yeah i talk to my kids a little bit and say listen when you sit there and listen to this shit so loud just know that 30 years from now you may not be able to hear anything and then you've done the so, best you could oh it's so crazy you don't have ringing in your ears howard i don't have ringing in my ear but i have a small cock if anyone wants to hear oh. about that <laughs> i mean if we're bringing up our problems i got that uh you're giving a uh, public try, service announcements tr- on that try uh, try going through like yeah i'm actually recording one today tiny penis syndrome uh, it's a real drag you guys don't want to hear about it <laughs> do you get tired of playing any certain songs like billy joel retired just the way you are or something i'm one of the songs he told me he retired because he couldn't stand you know playing it anymore are there any of your songs you just cannot ever fucking stomach playing again no no no, no. We, we we're and we play up we play a lot of di- i mean the the thing that we do for we've been doing it for about 10 years now is we play a different set list every night we haven't actually played Smart. the same set list since uh, 2003 yeah so uh, 10 years so we have about what 60 songs that we can more or less more or less <laughs> play yeah but certain so, but, but certain less. songs you have to play right or an well, audience I mean, will take you and throw play you out Sandman, of the man we're going to yeah. play nothing and we're going to play master puppets and we're going to play one but there's about 60 songs that we rotate in all the other except slots. in china <laughs> right and we and play w- in china uh, play couple, master of puppets uh, in china <laughs> yeah bill listen the chinese are being led like puppets is that your point maybe we that's were, that was were probably the government's point <laughs> <laughs> the, the government said you cannot play that. Yeah, we had to give them a, 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 a whole, set list. Oh yeah, a whole set of, of songs, and they went through oh, all the lyrics and okay, wow. which ones we can play, which ones we couldn't play. Aren't you shocked by a government that has to be so anal that like, to be to, about music? About music, it's fucking. They're so scared over there it about their very, people getting on the internet or anything like that. Yeah. It is a bummer, and like you know. They see they see a, a a lyric like "Master of Puppets" being so sub- subversive that you know they they they're not allowing us to play it. It's kind of oh, scary. Well, Should just fucking draw more played attention it. to it, of course. Which it, that doesn't work. Did you consider we, canceling were, the I gotta show? I got to tell you something. There were forty thousand kids over those two nights that were. I mean, fucking. They were really responded to what we we're doing. I mean, it was insane. the Chinese. Oh, uh, it was insane. They'd Whatever been rules they set down, they they didn't. The, I mean, the fans were there to have fun. We got our right. foot in the door. We were able to go and play in China. That was the key. That How do you key. think your music even gets into China when you think about it? Right. Like bootlegs. Did. Bootlegs. Sure. Bootlegs. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's great. It's great. Did you there consider no, canceling? No borders, man. When the government, but when the government said to you, you cannot play Master of Puppets, did you consider canceling? No. 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 You, you know what I did is uh, during I had like a, 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 a open guitar solo thing where I just sit there and riff. I played the riff for Master of Puppets and a couple other songs that, that weren't allowed to be played. But I played this just the music, so I kind of snuck it so in. So your own way of being subversive. Exactly. I like that. And the audience knows what's happening, right? Totally. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's not a secret. I mean, what we're talking right. about here is not a secret. They published it on government websites, what songs we could play and what we couldn't. I mean, it's... It's fine. How'd you choose the set list for the movie? Like, that's a tough... Like, you know the movie's gonna sort of be there forever. Right. We asked the Chinese government. Chinese government wrote the set list. <laughs> this is smart. These fuckers know what they were doing. Their shows went over big. Yeah. I like that the Chinese government had to listen to your music and make a set list. That's so beautiful. Can you imagine? That Whose job great. was that? Actually, yeah, that is I just want great. Footage of that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, really? boys, what can I say? I got that job. A million thanks. I know getting up early and doing this, you certainly don't need this aggravation, but you have given me no. the treat of a lifetime to sit this close and watch you guys play is just remarkable. And you guys are masterful musicians. And I would give you the Kennedy Center honor, but those fuckers won't listen to me. Mm. They, they, they haven't won't. given when, you one. If yet. we get there, maybe you could uh, give us the award or induct us in your ass with my ass cheeks. Fly in again. And my yes. small cock. Come in on a wire again. Bring the wire back. You guys will be accepted as the Kennedy Center honors way before I will, man. It ain't gonna happen in my lifetime. Well, um, we thank you, Howard, man, for having us and supporting thank you. us. And you've always been in support for us. Well, you man. bet. I love this band. This band, may you long live and may you prosper and thank you for the Metallica channel. Thanks for the new movie, too. 3D thank film, you. Metallica through the never. And anytime you guys feel like playing, you know where to come. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, brother. All right, I'll thank never you. see Thanks, you again, Howard. I'm sure, but whatever. <laughs> All right. And uh, we'll be back after these words.